Turkish Airlines Flight 981. On March 3, 1974, Turkish Airlines Flight 981 lifted off from Paris bound for London, carrying 346 people. It should have been a routine hop across the channel, but minutes after takeoff, disaster struck. At 23,000 feet, the rear cargo door, flawed in both design and execution, tore away from the aircraft. The explosive decompression ripped a section of the cabin floor apart, taking six passengers with it and severing the control cables that connected the pilots to the plane's rudder and elevators. With their controls destroyed, the crew had no way to save the aircraft. For 77 seconds, the DC-10 became uncontrollable, pitching forward and accelerating at terrifying speed. In the cockpit, alarms blared while the first officer shouted, The fuselage has burst. Those final moments ended as the jet slammed into the Hermanonville forest near Paris at nearly 487 miles per hour, shattering into thousands of fragments. Every soul on board, 335 passengers and 11 crew, was lost. The scale of the devastation was almost indescribable. Recovery teams later found some 20,000 body fragments, with only 188 victims ever identified. The tragedy exposed a disturbing truth. McDonnell Douglas had known of the cargo door's vulnerabilities after a similar failure two years earlier on American Airlines Flight 96. Engineers had warned that if the latches failed, the plane could be lost. Yet, the redesign was minimal. Paperwork showed fixes as complete when they weren't, and critical warnings never reached the crews working with these jets. The door on Flight 981, in fact, had been crudely modified. Its locking pins filed down so ground staff could force it shut. The aftermath was brutal. Lawsuits mounted into the hundreds of millions of dollars, with McDonnell Douglas paying around $80 million, part of a settlement estimated at around $100 million. Only then was the DC-10's cargo door fully redesigned, but for 346 lives, the changes came too late. American Airlines Flight 191 On May 25, 1979, Chicago's O'Hare International Airport became the stage for the deadliest aviation accident in U.S. history. American Airlines Flight 191, a McDonnell Douglas DC-10 bound for Los Angeles, lifted off the runway carrying 271 people. Just seconds into takeoff, the left engine detached from the wing, ripped over the top, and crashed onto the runway. In that violent moment, hydraulic lines were severed and the left wing slats retracted, robbing it of lift. The aircraft rolled left, reaching a terrifying 112-degree bank and slammed into an open field less than a mile from the runway. Everyone on board perished, along with two people on the ground bringing the death toll to 273. The cause was traced back to maintenance shortcuts. To save time and money, American Airlines had adopted a procedure using forklifts to remove the engine and pylon as a single unit, rather than following McDonnell Douglas's recommended method. The slightest misalignment damaged the pylon structure, leaving hidden cracks that grew worse over weeks of service. On Flight 191, those cracks gave way. The consequences extended far beyond Chicago. The FAA grounded every DC-10 in the U.S. within two weeks, suspending its type certificate. Public confidence in the jet collapsed overnight. American Airlines was fined $500,000, about $1.6 million today, for improper maintenance. The tragedy also reshaped aviation oversight. Mandatory stick shakers for both pilots, redesigned slat systems, and tighter scrutiny of airline maintenance practices. What remains most haunting are the human stories. Among the victims were inventor Itzhak Bentov and music promoter Leonard Stoggle, whose parents themselves had died in a crash years earlier. For decades, Flight 191 had no memorial until a student-led campaign finally built one in 2011. Forty years on, the name Flight 191 is still synonymous with loss, preventable error, and reforms written in tragedy's shadow. Air New Zealand Flight 901 on a serene morning in November 1979, Air New Zealand Flight 901 took off from Auckland embarking on a unique sightseeing trip to Antarctica. The journey was sold as a breathtaking experience, with an expert guide on board to point out landmarks. But unknown to the crew and the 257 people aboard, a subtle change had been made to the flight plan just hours before departure. A set of coordinates which previously guided the plane safely down the middle of McMurdo Sound was quietly changed to point the aircraft directly at a 12,448-foot-high mountain named Mount Erebus. The crew, confident in their inertial navigation system and unaware of the switch, believed they were flying over the flat, open waters of the sound. The weather below them was clear, but the conditions created a deadly optical illusion known as sector whiteout. 
where the white of the snow-covered volcano blended perfectly with the clouds above. The deceptive phenomenon made the mountain appear as a flat, distant expanse of ice. The pilots, believing they were safely over the ice shelf, began to descend for a better view. By the time the ground proximity warning system screamed an alarm, it was far too late. The crew had only six seconds to react before the plane crashed into the mountain, a horrifying impact that killed everyone instantly. The subsequent investigation revealed the shocking truth. The crash was not due to pilot error, but a critical failure to inform the crew of a new fatal flight path. A royal commission of inquiry uncovered what was described as a litany of lies from airline executives who attempted to cover up the mistake. The tragedy, which remains New Zealand's deadliest peacetime disaster, exposed a deep flaw in communication and accountability, leading to a complete re-evaluation of air safety protocols and ultimately ending commercial sightseeing flights over the Antarctic for many years. UTA Flight 772 On September 19, 1989, a McDonnell Douglas DC-10 carrying 170 people lifted off from N'Djamena, Chad, bound for Paris. 46 minutes into the flight, at 35,000 feet, a suitcase bomb hidden in the cargo hold tore the aircraft apart over the Sahara Desert. The wreckage of UTA Flight 772 rained down across hundreds of miles of sand. No one survived. It remains the deadliest aviation disaster in Niger's history. The victims came from 18 countries, with large groups of French, Chadian, and Congolese passengers. Among them was Bonnie Barnes Pugh, wife of the U.S. ambassador to Chad, and eight oil workers returning from a drilling project. Half a hundred victims were never identified. The tragedy reached far beyond borders, leaving ripples of grief from Paris to Kinshasa to Washington. Investigators concluded that Libyan agents were behind the bombing, motivated by revenge after France supported Chad in its war against Libya. Six Libyans, including Muammar Gaddafi's brother-in-law, Abdullah Sanusi, were tried in absentia in France and convicted. Years later, Libya agreed to pay $170 million in compensation, $1 million for each life lost. But U.S. families pushed further, winning a $6 billion judgment in a Washington court, a ruling Libya fiercely appealed. In 2008, Libya contributed $1.5 billion to a broader settlement fund, leading the U.S. government to restore its legal immunity. The desert itself carries the memory. In 2007, victims' families constructed a striking memorial six miles from the crash site, a massive outline of a DC-10 made from black rock encircled by a compass with 170 mirrors glinting in the sun to honor each life. Over time, the Sahara's shifting sands began reclaiming it, as if the desert insists on folding the story back into silence. Yet the name Flight 772 still lingers, a reminder of loss, justice pursued, and grief written into the earth itself. United Airlines Flight 232 On July 19, 1989, a United Airlines DC-10 took off from Denver on what seemed like a routine flight. But a little over an hour into the trip, at 37,000 feet, the impossible happened. The tail engine of the aircraft suffered a catastrophic, uncontained failure when a manufacturing defect in its fan disc caused it to explode. Debris from the engine shot out in all directions, severing all three of the plane's redundant hydraulic systems, the very systems that control the rudder, ailerons, and elevators. Suddenly, the crew lost all conventional control of their massive jet. In the cockpit, Captain Al Haynes and his crew faced a seemingly hopeless situation. They had no way to steer or control the aircraft. But as the plane began an uncontrollable descent, an off-duty pilot, Captain Dennis Fitch, who was a passenger on the flight, volunteered to help. The crew found that by manipulating the two remaining wing-mounted engines, they could make rough adjustments to the plane's direction and altitude. With Fitch in the cockpit, controlling the throttles by hand, they began the painstaking process of guiding the crippled airliner toward the nearest airport in Sioux City, Iowa. What happened next became a legendary feat of airmanship. The team of pilots, using a method that had no official procedure, managed to guide the plane to the runway. They were going too fast and descending too steeply to land safely, but their improvised control allowed them to crash land in a relatively controlled manner. The impact broke the plane into pieces and a fire erupted. But thanks to the heroic efforts of the crew and the rapid response of emergency services, 184 of the 296 people on board survived. It was a crash that should have killed everyone. But the skill and ingenuity of the crew turned a total catastrophe into a remarkable story of survival. Korean Air Flight 803 On July 27, 1989, 
A McDonnell Douglas DC-10 carrying 199 people approached Tripoli International Airport in thick fog. The aircraft, Korean Air Flight 803, had already traveled thousands of miles from Seoul, making stops in Bangkok and Jeddah. On board were mostly South Korean construction workers returning to Libya after visiting their families, along with a few Libyan and Japanese nationals. The morning should have ended with a routine landing, but visibility dropped to as little as 100 feet. The airport's instrument landing systems, a critical aid in such conditions, was out of service. At 7.05 a.m., the DC-10 descended below the safe decision height without the runway in sight. Instead of touching down, it struck buildings in an orchard just one and a half miles short of the runway, shattering into three burning sections. 74 passengers and crew perished instantly, joined by six people on the ground. Another 125 survived, many with severe injuries. It was Libya's deadliest aviation disaster at the time and still ranks as its third worst. The tragedy raised unsettling questions. A Soviet airliner had diverted to Malta an hour earlier rather than risk the fog. Yet Flight 803 pressed on. The captain later admitted he lost contact with the control tower for 15 minutes before the crash. Libyan courts held the captain and first officer responsible, convicting them of negligence. The captain was sentenced to two years in prison, while the first officer's 18-month sentence was suspended. French investigators pieced together the recorders, confirming pilot error compounded by poor conditions. The accident underscored the dangers of pressing ahead with unstable approaches and highlighted gaps in international cooperation, as American investigators were barred from Libya. The loss reverberated through families, companies like Dawu and Donga, and across borders. An accident born not from mechanical failure, but from choices made in a fog too thick to see. Western Airlines Flight 2605 In the early morning hours of October 31st, 1979, Western Airlines Flight 2605, known as the Night Owl, approached Mexico City International Airport after leaving Los Angeles at 1.40 a.m. The McDonnell Douglas DC-10 carried 75 passengers and 13 crew members, with fog blanketing the city as dawn began to break. Mexico City's runway 23L was closed for resurfacing, yet the controllers cleared the crew to follow its instrument landing system and then sidestep over to the open runway 23R. The sidestep was never properly briefed, and the radio calls lacked the precise language familiar to U.S. pilots. The DC-10 continued its approach toward the closed runway. At 5.42 a.m., the wheel struck the ground off alignment, left gear on grass, right gear on the shoulder. Realizing the error, the crew attempted a go-around. But just seconds later, the right landing gear slammed into a dump truck loaded with 10 tons of earth. The collision tore the gear away, ripped into the tail, and scattered debris across a 1,300-foot stretch of the airfield. Still airborne, the crippled jet rolled violently to the right, clipping an excavator before its wing cut into the ground and nearby taxiways. The DC-10's final impact came against an Eastern Airlines service building, 26 seconds after its first touchdown. The aircraft broke apart, sparking a massive fire that consumed most of the structure. Of the 88 people on board, 72 lost their lives, along with one maintenance worker on the ground. 16 passengers survived, many pulled from a 20-foot section of fuselage that remained intact. This accident remains Mexico City's deadliest aviation disaster. Investigators cited non-compliance with weather minimums, procedural lapses, and the confusion surrounding the sidestep approach. The tragedy prompted safety recommendations, ensuring future approach charts would explicitly define sidestep maneuvers, an expensive lesson written in loss rather than dollars. Martin Air Flight 495 On December 21st, 1992, Holidaymakers heading from Amsterdam to Portugal found their trip ending in disaster. Martin Air Flight 495, a McDonnell Douglas DC-10 carrying 327 passengers and 13 crew members, faced severe weather as it approached Faro Airport. A powerful thunderstorm loomed over the region, bringing heavy rain, strong crosswinds, and dangerous wind shear. Controllers warned the crew about water on the runway, but the challenges went far beyond slick pavement. After one aborted attempt, the aircraft lined up for another approach. In those final moments, the DC-10 flew through at least two microbursts, sudden downdrafts capable of overwhelming even the largest aircraft. The landing was brutally hard, exceeding the manufacturer's design limits. The right landing gear collapsed under the stress, the wing tore away, and the ruptured fuel tanks ignited. The fuselage split in two, leaving the front section toppled on its side amid smoke and fire. 56 people were killed, 54 passengers and two crew, 
while 106 others suffered serious injuries. In total, 284 survived, many escaping through the torn fuselage. For those who lived, survival came down to where they sat and how quickly rescuers reached them in the chaos. The causes of the crash remain debated. Portuguese investigators emphasized a dangerously steep descent, excessive sink rate, and the effect of crosswinds on an already weakened landing gear. The Dutch authorities pointed to wind shear as the critical factor, worsened by the crew's premature reduction of engine power and disengagement of the autopilot at the worst possible time. Years later, lawsuits and fresh analysis reopen questions with claims of pilot error, incomplete black box data, and even overlooked maintenance issues. Despite its scale, the disaster received less global attention than similar crashes of the era. Survivors later formed the Anthony Royce Foundation, named after the aircraft to make sure their voices were heard.